Just raise your hand up. Yeah, can everyone see this? Yeah. Yes, we can we see it. So, um, yeah, so this is basically a series, a radiology series that um, we came up with um, because I've kind of noticed that um, both over here, students over here, as well as uh, students over there, even being an alumni of Nazareth myself, um, we don't really learn that much about radiology in the sense where we apply it in like a clinical context. Um, so I thought particularly because you are going to be thrown in the deep end as FY1s in this country anyway, um, you will need to have a working understanding of basic interpretation of x-rays, be it chest, be it abdominal, be it trauma, and also in case someone does need to go for a CT head, you need to find out any kind of acute um, features on the CT as well. So this series should hopefully cover the basics of that and so that you will be a bit more sort of well versed in uh, interpreting them anyway. So a little bit about myself, as Preeti did say, I did graduate from Masaryk in 2020. Um, now, since then, um, I started my job as an FY1 locum in general surgery in Royal Oldham Hospital, just uh, north of Manchester. Um, and I did that for four months. It was very, very good. I think anyone who um, kind of wants to start off, they should really try and do like a surgical rotation first, just to get into the idea of doing a lot more practical procedures, as well as um, handling certain medical emergencies when they're on call. Um, next, I shifted over to uh, stroke medicine, and I did this for eight months um, as a junior clinical fellow in Stockport. And I think this is where I got, I got put into the deep end because here you have to rely on a lot of radiology, particularly CT heads and a lot of chest x-rays because stroke, although it mainly does cover the brain, the consequences of stroke will lead to a multitude of symptoms that you have to manage, particularly in those long stroke patients. Um, and you, we had to see radiology after radiology every single day, be it, like I said, a CT head, be it um, um, a, a chest x-ray because you're suspecting some kind of aspiration pneumonia, or maybe because the NG tube isn't working, or even an abdominal x-ray because they've been lying down in bed for too long and they're constipated and you have to basically request an abdominal x-ray for them. On a rare occasion, we had to also do a lot of trauma x-rays because they are old people. They will have a bit of delirium, you know, it depends upon their day. Um, and they usually have some falls as well. So there we go. We have to also have a working knowledge of how to identify NOFs, so neck of femur fractures. And whilst I was there, I decided to go in and apply for a standalone F2. So right now I am an F2 and I am doing these rotations. So neurology, general practice and a &E, and that's in Hull. Now enough about me. Now about this series, essentially, um, you, like I said before, you are expected to interpret basic scans. Um, what do I mean by, by that? I mean that there is, there are going to be, you know, SHOs, there are going to be registrars that will definitely help you. However, when you are in an acute setting, particularly when I mean acute, I mean on call or AE, even AMU, um, you will not, you can't necessarily always rely on them. The initial planning, the initial interpretations, the initial management, they, it all has to come from you. And you can double check with your superior after that. But ideally, you are expected to interpret these and you are also expected to act upon them. So your management actually is very, very important in this as well. You'll basically learn the practicalities of interpretation. And what do I mean by that? I mean that interpretation is only one part of it. So when you are given a scan, yes, you can finally, you know, you can, you can kind of see the pathology, you can draw up your own conclusions in it. But at the end of the day, that is just one half. The other half is making sure whether at all that scan is adequate, it is of good quality, it is, it is, it is, it is deemed necessary as well in that patient. So we'll be going through a bit of that as well. And finally, it's for you guys to gain some confidence. Now, speaking to a lot of F1s, including, you know, I was in this position myself as well. My the first time I, I got given a chest X-ray and the consultant asked me what it was, I, I, I had to say, I, I really don't know. Um, and I, it, was, it was very bad because I should have at least made an attempt of trying to interpret it. 
Um, but I, I did not have the knowledge for that at that time. Um, and I, I did not have the confidence to say what it was at the time. So you learn, and I did not want any other medical student who will be put on the deep end like this to have that problem as well. So hopefully this should you know, give you some more confidence about this, right? What will we be talking about today? What are the learning objectives? So number one, firstly, we want to know how these chest x-rays are obtained. It's easy to just request one, but you also need to know how it is obtained in order to understand the image itself a little bit more and therefore interpret it in whatever context that image was obtained in. Second thing, we also need to know about what we mean by views. So there's several ways um, that I, we can talk about it, but the most common views are your AP, PA, and lateral. What do I mean by that? I mean anteroposterior, posterior, anterior, and the lateral one. There are other views as well that you can you need to know, and most of the time, these views, these other views, they they're more to do with because of a compromise in the patient. That's why we actually have those views. But these ones are the most important ones. These three are the most important ones, of which the PA is the most important one and also gives you the best quality of image as well. Next, how do we actually inspect the quality of the image? Now, oftentimes you just dive straight in, you just look at the image and you try and find if there's a if there's some kind of consolidation, we immediately go for, okay, you know, there must be some kind of pneumonia over here. First things first, always start from the basics. You always have to know whether you, the, the image that you, you are given is valid and it is, you know, you can, you can go in further and you can actually interpret the image. If it is not valid, there's no point in interpreting that image because it will lead to you coming up with conclusions that might not necessarily be suitable. And finally, we have to try and drill you in with a sort of an approach, a systematic approach to interpret these chest x-rays. Um, I'll, I'll tell you more about that as we go on, but uh, let's carry on with, oh, and finally, of course, to um, understand what the normal anatomy of these radiographs are, okay? Right, quick question for everyone. And you can just unmute yourself and you can just have a, have a just, just, just say it out loud. Um, why do we do a chest x-ray? or you can just type in the chat box as well. Okay, so you look for a consolidation. Okay, why are you looking for a consolidation? There's someone that's um, it's completely fine. Do we just order a chest x-ray just like that to look for a consolidation? Okay, to assess lung pathologies, that's good, okay. Okay, that's fine as well. Perfect. Okay. Now, a simple way to actually split this up. Yeah, that's good as well. Good, good. Now, a simple way to split this up is actually by splitting up as we do with any kind of condition, any symptoms, any signs, and any kind of feature that you think that there might be going on as well. So what do I mean by that? I mean, symptoms wise, One second. Oh. Symptoms wise, I mean, if they have any kind of BSIM, so shortness of breath, any kind of chest pain, cough, hemoptysis, any fever and weight loss. So these are the symptoms that you should be looking for and you should be suspecting, okay, you know, a chest x-ray might be worth it. There might be, it might give us a clue into what's going on. What, what else do I mean? I mean, signs as well. So hypoxemia. So obviously hypoxemia is not something that you can easily spot. You usually have to do an ABG in order to see if there is any hypoxemia going on in the arterial blood in order for you to then think about you know, chest x-ray. Now, does everyone know what PFTs are? Yes, no? It means pulmonary function tests. Now, if there are any abnormal pulmonary function tests, um, for instance, if there is any disease that is kind of going towards a restrictive lung disease or kind of an obstructive lung disease, you generally do a CT scan. But prior to that, you oftentimes do an X-ray as well. Okay. And what else do we do it for? We also do it for if we kind of put in any kind of artificial devices. So lines, central lines, any kind of pick lines, any kind of tubes. By tubes, I mean um, nasogastric tubes mostly. Okay, and finally, we also do it if we are suspecting any possible 
procedural risks. So oftentimes, um, when you when when a patient has had a lung biopsy, uh, they are very very risk well they're very prone to developing a pneumothorax. So if at all they develop even one one wrong symptom after this biopsy, you generally do an X-ray just to rule it out. And of course, post pacemaker placement as well. Um, I've actually had a case where we put a central line into a patient, the patient got delirious, yanked the central line out, developed shortness of breath. Um, I ordered the chest x-ray and it turned out she had a massive left-sided pneumothorax. So these are the kind of things that you should be thinking of whenever we kind of, whenever we, 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 we request a chest x-ray. Okay, so not, and these are all the things that you think are abnormal. Um, but in general, before a surgery, before an operation, we always request routine chest x-ray as well. Now, I haven't really put them down because I don't, it's not really necessary to request a routine chest x-ray. They do it anyway, but it's not necessary to request it if the patient is not showing any kind of symptoms. Okay, now what do we know about the procedure? It's a very, very simple procedure. On the left, you have a source, um, usually... Um, it's a source that emits um, X-ray photons. Uh, they're very high in energy. Some of these photons are absorbed. Some of these photons are passed through. The ones that are passed through are the ones that are detected by the film plate at the end. And that is usually also known as a detector. Um, and they are the ones that are digitally linked to any kind of packed software that will then display the image in modern hospitals. Now, in between that, you have the patient. The patient usually stands a fair distance away from the x-ray itself, from the x-ray source itself. And this is just so that you can get a good image at the end of the day. If at all the patient stands too close, then what you'll have is that the image that you detect might be a lot bigger and therefore it will it'll, it'll cause a reduction in the quality of the image itself. Okay, so... What do, do we know what um, the term brightness means? Can anyone tell me what the term brightness means? Oops. Anyone? Just type in the chat box. And what do we what do we talk about when we, when we think when we say brightness? Yeah, the brighter, the more dense, that's true. But what does brightness mean when you're talking about the context of an x-ray? So we say brightness, we say shadows, we say pacifications. I think, uh, okay, fine. Light can't pass, okay. Okay, fine. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Okay, radio loose and radio opaque, fine. Um, so the brightness basically means those are, they're kind of hinting towards those areas where the x-rays have not hit the detector. So that means that those photons that are going through those areas have been absorbed by that tissue that is in that region. That is what brightness sort of implies. Um, there are a couple of factors that affect this brightness. Now, the most common factor that affects it, and, and it's right that you've already mentioned it, is the density. So the higher the density of the tissue, the more x-rays will be absorbed. And so therefore, they won't actually pass through the, um, the body and thereby hit the detector. Another factor that will affect is the thickness. Now, I'd like to think of thickness being a factor when you want to sort of imagine the following. Um, say if you have a beaker of water and you emit x-rays through it and you obtain a certain type of brightness, okay? You have two beakers of water and you pass the same amount of x-ray, the same duration through it, through, the, through these two beakers, you'd obtain a different brightness. The reason behind it is because although the density of the water might be the exact same, the thickness is different. So therefore it will impede the x-rays from going through to and thereby hitting and producing the same level of brightness. The final thing that will affect the brightness is the duration of exposure. What do I mean with the duration of exposure? I mean that how long you let the x-rays, well, how long you let the source stay on to emit these x-rays. Now, imagine this, you have, um, you have my hand that's being x-rayed. If my hand is x-rayed for one minute, 
okay? Um, and it's coming up on the detector. You can see the image, it's a beautiful image of a hand. Um, and you can see the individual bones in that, in that image as well. Um, if at all, that same hand has been exposed for longer. So say if it was for two minutes or for three minutes, can anyone has a guess as to how the, the, the brightness will be affected? Will it be brighter or will it be less bright? Just put it in the chat box, brighter or less bright and why? Why, 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 why do you, why, why do you think it'll be less bright? <laughs> right, okay, so, um, like I said before, the, the, the kind of picture that you get on the detector, um, it shows the areas where the x-rays do not get through, and it shows the areas where the x-rays do get through, and get through, it appears dark. Now, if I let the x-rays go on for longer and longer, that means more and more x-rays will have the chance to get through. And so the result of it means that more and more x-rays will be fired at the detector as well. So, okay, so if it's the same density, same thickness, but the duration of exposure is longer, you might have a lesser quality image because you have a less bright image as well. Okay, and you can't really identify or you can't really appreciate the difference in densities of the different tissues that you are x-raying at that time. Okay. Oh, there we go. So next we go into views. So can anyone tell me what view this is? What view is this? So Ahmed got it right. It is a PA view. Excellent. Anubis got it right. Sorry, Sarah. Um, now, why why does everyone think it's a PA view? What features does it give away that it's a PA view? Can anyone tell me how to look out for those features? Okay, the heart is more anteriorly. Mm. Scapula. Okay. 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 Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, you're right. The heart is more anteriorly, um, but it's not really a good reason to justify why it might be a PA view. I'll, I'll get back to you on that why, but definitely the scapula. I don't know whether you know the reason why I say yes to the scapula, but definitely the scapula. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll explain a bit more. So, yes, this is a PA view. Now, the PA view by far is the best quality view that you can get for an x-ray. The reason why is because it measures the heart at, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the correct size, okay? Um, in addition to that, you can notice how, let me get the pointer out, maybe that will be better. There we go. Right, you can notice how the clavicles are actually a bit more horizontal, uh, are a bit more oblique over here. That is also one good way of determining whether it's a PA view or not, okay? Now, in addition to that, we generally do go for, we generally go for this view as well. And this is quite obvious, it's a lateral view. And the lateral view means that you can determine if there is any kind of pathologies happening um, in, in, in the back portions of the lungs. And what do I mean by the back portion of the lungs? Um, does everyone know where the oblique fissure is? It kind of splits the lung, well, the left lung into the inferior and into the superior lobes. Um, now, if everyone remembers their anatomy correctly, um, the inferior lobe, it's kind of wrongly named as the inferior lobe. Yes, it goes all the way down past the, back, the, the diaphragm at the back. But realistically, the inferior lobe also extends all the way up to the axilla and the back. Okay. Uh, we need a lateral view in order to see if there is any kind of pathology happening in this lobe, even if it's at the back. Finally, we have this AP view, and here's where the scapula comes into account. As you can see over here, let me get the pointer out again. 
as you can see over here, you can see this side over here. So this is something that you will not see on a PA view. And this is the medial border of the scapula, as you can see it. And you can also appreciate how much more horizontal the clavicles are. Now, I know that a couple of you mentioned in the chat box regarding the heart. Um, yes, the heart is there in this as well, but what, what is different about this view? What, what, what exactly is different about this? Yeah, exactly. It can erroneously give an impression of a cardiomegaly. Exactly. Now, that is exactly why oftentimes you need to know what view it is. So usually on the top right corner of the x-ray, um, it'll be given whether it's a PA or an AP view. Anyone want to, anyone kind of have a guess as to why you would do an AP view? I mean, if we, if we all know that uh, a PA view is a lot better, why would anyone want to do an AP view? Or is it by choice or do they have no choice? Can anyone guess? Why would we need to do an AP view? Why would we do an AP view in the first place? You can do one if they can't stand. Yeah, exactly. Good. Thank you. Um, and what situation would you want to do an AP view in? So they can't stand. That's one of them. So when does that usually happen? And what kind of x-ray machine would we use? Yeah, in a traumatic event, exactly. Or just simply, yeah, a portable one, exactly. Yeah, a mobile x-ray machine, exactly. Uh, yeah, you'd, exa you'd, you'd, do, you'd, do, you'd use a portable x-ray machine for any of the AP views. It's not, it's not generally justified as to why you'd want to do an AP view from the, from the get-go. If you can get a PA view, then obtain a PA. Um, but generally, it is not really favored, the AP view. Right, okay, so that's a quick introduction about views. So this is what I mean. So this is the difference itself between the PA and AP view. And here you can really appreciate the difference in heart size. Now, if someone told me that the image on the right is a PA view, I'd be a little bit more concerned because that would kind of border on cardiomegaly. Um, if you calculate the cardiothoracic ratio, that is just about, just maybe just a bit over 50% of uh, um, uh, the, 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 whole thoracic, um, the whole thoracic width. Um, and if someone were to tell me that um, the heart size on the right is normal, no, that isn't, that's definitely not normal. And that is definitely, that requires further investigation. Okay, so this is the actual cause of the difference itself. So when you position the, the patient up against the, the detector or the X-ray film in this case, um, you can see that the heart, um, on a PA would be about 13 centimeters, yet on an AP, because of the diversion of the X-ray beams itself, would make it look a lot bigger. So this is just a simple explanation as to why you would rather trust the uh, PA view rather than the AP view. Okay, quality of the image. Now, there's several things that we need to understand about the quality of the image. Would you accept the image that you see on the screen? as a good quality image? Would you accept it as a valid image? If yes, say that. If no, say why. Why? Why will you not accept that? Good, okay. It doesn't show the whole lung. Any other reasons? I mean, you can see most of the lung. You could argue that, but you're right. It doesn't, sh it doesn't show the whole lung. Any other reasons? why you shouldn't accept that. Mm, could be a zoomed image. <laughs> right, there are three main things wrong with this. And that is that the first ribs, you can't see them. You always need to see the first ribs. The reason why, is because you need to see the apices of the lungs. And the apices of the lungs in a PA view are always above the first ribs. The second reason, you cannot see the costophrenic angles. So that means you will not be able to see if there's any pleural effusion in this. And finally, you should always see the lateral edges of the ribs. So a more apt image would be this one. 
So here you can see the edges, here you can see the CP angles, and here you can also see the first ribs. Is that okay for everyone? So this is the sort of a, sort of like a first filter or the first criteria that you have to go through um, before you sort of want to interpret this x-ray. So this is the kind of validity check, okay? I mean, of course, before you do anything, you have to always check the information of the patient, the name, the date of birth, the NHS number, and so on and so forth. But when it comes to just the raw image, you need to make sure that all these things are present before you even proceed any further. Right, next thing, the rotation. Now, what do I mean by the rotation? I don't know. Rotation of what? Not really the scapula, it's, the, it's more about the rotation of the patient, okay? So when I mean the rotation of the patient, um, you have to bear in mind that because you're dealing with a three-dimensional object, the patient, they can rotate in three different axes. Now, for the purposes of this talk, I'm only going to be focusing on two of these axes. And the reason why is because the third axis, it does not really cause much of um, um, an interference with uh, the X-ray quality itself. So the first one, the first axis is this one. So imagine a horizontal line passing through like this. Now, by that, I mean if the patient is upright or if they're bending slightly or if they're bending backwards, okay? And the second axis would be this one, like this. So that means if they're tilted to the right or tilted to the left, okay? And that will have an effect on the quality of the image that you get. And the reason why is because, there you go, it's because of this. Now, say if you are obtaining a, a PA uh, view of the X-ray or chest X-ray, and if the patient is rotated to the left, because of the way the heart itself is within the media sinum, um, you might get a wrong, a wrong size of the heart, which will lead to you suspecting a cardiomegaly. And if the patient were to be rotated to the right, the heart will appear smaller and therefore you might suspect something else as a result of that. Um, so it's really important for you to understand the rotation itself. Now, a good way to see if the rotation itself is right or not is by looking at the spinous processes. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean this. So you can see over here that these spinous processes are exactly in the midline. And what do I mean by midline? I mean right in the middle of the trachea. On top of that, they're also exactly in the middle of the two medial ends of the clavicle. Now, if that is that, that criteria is met, you can safely say that, yes, this patient is not rotated. Another check that you could do is, and this is only if you've seen the patient yourself, is you can compare the length of the clavicles over here. And if one of them appears smaller than the other, then you can probably safely assume that yes, this person has rotated and therefore you need to take that rotation into consideration before you interpret that X-ray. So a rotation doesn't really impede you on proceeding with the interpretation, but it will have to factor in when you are interpreting it. Right, next thing, what, what else can determine the quality of the image? Inspiration. Now have a look at this X-ray. Would you say this X-ray, what, what, what alarm bells would ring when you see this X-ray? Too little air. Okay, good. And so what would you suspect if there's too little air in it? Would you be alarmed? Would you be, would you be bleeping your SHO, bleeping your reg straight away saying, oh God, oh God. Okay, good. Fluidothorax, hydrothorax, good. Or 
some people might even say that there might be some kind of a cardiomegaly going on over there by looking at that, the heart size there. Some people could also say that, oh my God, there might be some kind of restrictive um, uh, pulmonary disease going on over there as well. But again, you have to pay attention to a couple of the features and those features are how much the patient has inspired. Now, this is all the job of the radio, radiographer, the technician, to kind of guide the patient itself. But in case they've made a mess up and they really don't know what they're doing and they've presented this quality, then you need to double check with them. And the easiest way of doing it is by looking at the bony features of the X-ray. And the bones of the X-ray, they are the best in determining whether or not there is any changes in uh, inspiration, any changes in rotation, and something else that I'll get to in a bit as well. So in this case, look for the ribs. Now, this is the first rib over here. It's easier to spot the posterior part of the rib rather than the anterior, just because it just hi it's just highlighted a little bit more. But in this case, you can see the, the anterior part of the first rib coming in over here. Here we have the second, here we have the third, here we have the fourth, and this is the fifth, and this is the sixth. These are all the six. There's a fifth anterior, anterior rib going on to the posterior side, and this is a sixth posterior rib coming down to the anterior. What determines whether or not a patient has inspired fully or not is how many ribs you can see. So if you can, you, can, you, can, you can determine this whether by, by just looking at, by counting the number of posterior ribs you can see or by the number of anterior ribs that you can see. Usually it is acceptable for you to have seven anterior ribs kind of bisecting the midclavicular line and the hemidiaphragm, okay? Now I'll put up this image on the side as well after getting rid of the spotlight, here we go. So this would be a more appropriate, these are, by the way, these are the same patient, okay? But over here, you can clearly see that he, they have inspired properly and you can also rule out a cardiomegaly. And the reason for why you can rule out a cardiomegaly in this case, because number one, the heart size is adequate. Number two, they've inspired. And how can we say that? Counting the ribs, one, two, three, four, five, six, and the seventh one is just over here and is bisecting the hemidiaphragm right here along the midclavicular line. So if you see any number of ribs that is below seven, below six even, then you know that they have not inspired properly. Any, so if you see less than five ribs, it's usually considered to be uh, incomplete inspiration. If you see more than seven ribs, then that would be associated with hyperexpansion. Okay, so this is a good way of determining the quality of the X-ray, and thereby it needs to you need to take inspiration into account when you are determined when you are interpreting it as well. What's next? What else determines the quality of the image? And that would be penetration. So we have a good way of um, determining the penetration. You have low versus high exposure, and this exposure itself. It kind of depends upon the duration of exposure, the energy of the photons, as well as the source of the images. And so these three factors are the ones that determine the penetration of the, um, of the X-ray itself. Now, as we've said before, the duration of exposure will determine the brightness, okay? And therefore, if you are allowed, if you kind of let the duration for longer, then you will definitely have more penetration and therefore you'll have less of a brightness. The energy of the photons, now usually this is all calibrated by the radiographer. So before he even releases the image, before he even releases an acceptable image, it usually is um, uh, calibrated well um, before the radiologist gets a hand in at, 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 at um, interpreting it. And finally, the source to image distance. Now I've mentioned this before as well. Um, if the patient were to stand too close to the source, and if you put the detector a little further away, you will not get a good quality image because the dispersion of the X-ray photons will be too wide. And the same would apply if the detector were too close to the patient as well. So you need to have the right distance 
in order to get the right penetration and the right image. And any suboptimal penetration can lead to consequences of misdiagnosis. Now, what do I mean by systematic? Treatment? Here's where it gets a bit interesting. Has anyone gone through a systematic approach? Does anyone want to share, if at all, they know of a systematic approach at, um, at interpreting an x-ray? Well, which ones have you heard of before? That's, yeah, that's a very good one. Yeah. That's the exact one that I would use as well. And that's the exact one that I'm also going to be talking about right now. Now, before we go ahead with this, I just wanted to let you know that there is no one way to um, interpret chest x-rays. Everyone has their own approach, you know, has to you know, learn from what it is wrong with which they learned before they implement something new. Okay. Um, regardless of what approach you choose, regardless of what features you want to go for, every single time you have to check the patient's details and check the quality before you can deem that x-ray to be valid for you to carry on with the interpretation. So that, by that, I mean um, all the things that I've spoken about before, um, whether or not you can truly see the first ribs, the borders, as well as the costophrenic angles, and whether or not you need to take into account the rotation of the patient, the inspiration of the patient, as well as the penetration of the x-rays before you start interpreting. Every systematic approach will have a logical way of interpreting the x-ray. So that means it leads to no features being missed out. And that is a main thing. That is a main thing I want, to, I want, I want you to have as a take-home message. In every approach, no features should be missed. By that, I mean not just abnormal features, but no normal features should be missed either. Right. And as you've pointed out in the chat, I will be using the ABCDEF system as well. Now, what do I mean by that? So like I said, at the start, you always start off with the validity and the quality. Next, you go in with A, the airways. So next is these, the bones and the soft tissues while you're at it as well. C would be the cardiac silhouette and the mediastinal silhouette as well. D is for the diaphragm and the gastric bubble that you can see underneath in the stomach. E is for the plural effusions, but ideally it just stands for plural. You need to make sure the plural lines are seen and they're visible. F is for field. Now, here's where a lot of people would raise their eyebrows. What do I mean by field? Does anyone know what I mean by fields? Can we split the lung into fields? That's not how we learn the lung anatomically. But can we split the lung into fields? What would be the anatomical? Yeah, you can, it's fine. But we usually learn in anatomy that the lungs are split into lobes based on the fissures that we see, the oblique fissures, as well as horizontal fissure. Um, there's a bit of a problem with that, and it is that you cannot see them. You cannot see them on a chest x-ray, on a normal chest x-ray at all. The only time you'll be able to see these fissures, and I will definitely speak about this, is when there is any kind of fluid. And by that, I mean atelectasis or any kind of just general pulmonary congestion leading to pulmonary edema. And therefore, you have fluid literally hanging onto these lines, these fault lines of the lobes. Um, only then can you see these. And finally, oh, but we can't be trans. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and finally, what you have to also do is see other features. So other features we've already discussed is lines, tubes, and any kind of devices like pacemakers and so on. Right, so this is basically just my way of interpreting. And now I'm not gonna say that this is the only way, and I've already mentioned this before, everyone needs to go through something like this and find faults in it before they can derive or they wanna go in with their own way. But either way, 
no features should be missed. That's the main thing, you have to be safe. Now, the first features are always gonna be the airways. What do I mean by airways? I only am talking about three main things, and that is the trachea, and here you have the right main bronchus going over here, and then over here. Now, you can't really see this that well on the screen. You need packs so that you can um, sort of determine, you can change the contrast of it. But if you just squint a little and just shift your computer a little bit up, you can see the left main bronchus. And so you can see the carina just here. Okay. Now, what do what 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 features are you looking for in a normal X-ray? So the main thing is the, the position of the trachea. Is there any deviation? And here is where the quality of the image comes into account. If there has been any rotation, you will not be able to tell if the trachea is deviated or not because the spinous processes will not be in the center. And you always need to measure the deviation of the trachea based on the spinous process. So here in this x-ray, you'll be happy to know that the trachea is not deviated and it's exactly in the center, okay? And you can also see that the bronchi are following their corresponding pathways as well. So there's no problem in this one at all. So that is basically a quick normal airway, okay? What's next? Next are the bones. Now the bones are, I would say, the most interesting because they, they determine both the quality in terms of inspiration, in terms of penetration and the rotation of it. But at the same time, they're oftentimes missed. Um, now by missed, I mean, usually when you look, when anyone wants to quickly look at an X-ray, um, they just look at the lungs. But this system with ABCDF, it makes sure that the lungs are always interpreted at the very end, which means that any kind of feature that you see, you, you immediately spot before the lungs, even though the lungs are the most important, sort of the biggest features or the biggest organs that you see in an X-ray. So here in the bones, what, you, what are you looking out for? So the first thing you'll be looking out for are the spinous processes. And like I mentioned before, you have to always make sure that whether the spinous processes are in the center or not. So in this case, I'm talking about these over here. So in this case, they're all in the center. You can see the vertebral bodies. You can see the intervertebral discs over here as well. So that's all good. Next thing, what will you be looking for? You'll be looking out for the clavicle. Now, just out of interest, does anyone know what view this is? You've been paying attention. What view is this? Is it a PA, a lateral, or an AP? What view would you say this is? Good. It is an AP view. Why? Because you can see the medial border of the scapula and the clavicles are very horizontal. Yeah, good. Right. And like I mentioned, with the ribs, you have to be, you have to pay good, you have to pay close attention to which part of the ribs you're on about. So whether it's posterior or the, or the anterior. Now, posteriors are the ones that are more horizontal in nature. So these are all posterior ribs, okay? The, and they're, they're a lot more easier to spot than the anterior ribs. The anterior ribs are the ones that curve forward at this angle over here. They're more oblique in nature and they form this 45 degree angle over here. And they're the ones that you should be really looking out for when you're trying to determine whether the, the X-ray is of good quality in terms of inspiration. Now, I'm not going to go into the detail of the scapula or the, um, or the features of the scapula, the acromion or the glenoid cavity or the, um, the humerus in this, in this lecture, just because um, you'd be more interested for, um, to find out more about the pathologies of the lungs and associated um, uh, organs in the chest itself. Um, that'll be another thing about trauma that'll, that'll probably join in later. Um, but these are the main things that you need to look out for in terms of the bones. Now, here in this case, it's a perfect, it's a, it's, it's a good x-ray to show you as to what I mean by good inspiration. So here, I want you to tell me how many anterior ribs you can spot and what anterior rib and i want you to tell me 
is dissecting the, um, the hemidiaphragm at the midclavicular line. Just type it into the chat box. What rib is it? What number of rib is it? Yep, the answer is seven, exactly. So that means that this is actually a very good quality X-ray. You don't see any kind of rotation. And on top of that, the seventh rib is the one that is um, intersecting the, the diaphragm at the midclavicular line. So that means the person it has inspired adequately. In the bones. Now, when we are discussing pathologies, I will get into more detail about what I mean by lesions, both metastatic as well as um, caused by old age. I will also be getting into um, uh, what I mean by fractures and why it's a lot harder to spot fractures. Now, a funny, uh, an interesting thing about this particular x-ray as well, and it's something that I have to note, is these grooves. Does anyone know what these grooves are? Over here, here, you can see them in every single rib. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are these grooves for? And why is it so important? Yeah, blood vessels, you have a whole neurovascular bundle. You have all the subcostal vessels over there and you also have the subcostal nerves going through it. And why is that important? Why is it important to know that? Why is it important to know that particularly in a chest X-ray? And this is where clinical context comes into the picture. And if at all your SHO or your registrar asks you to do a procedure that they probably will do, um, it's important to know this and what procedure. Yes, exactly. It is very, very important to avoid damage to these nerves and vessels um, when you are trying to insert a chest strain. A chest strain, and there are, there are many times where this has gone wrong, and I've seen it as well, uh, where they haven't really paid any attention to um, the x-ray or they haven't really paid any attention to palpating the ribs properly um, before they've inserted the chest strain in, and it has resulted in a lot of blood loss because of that as well. Right, next thing, right, we're talking about the cardiac silhouette and the mediastinum. It's not really something that is, it, it doesn't really, it's not really pathognomic, but it's always good to know if there are any wrong markings, if the, if, the, if the markings are a little bit out of hand in order to know what kind of tests that you wanna request in the future. Now, in this case, you have, to, you have to see what the heart features are, okay? So let me just get, there we go, right. So I'm just gonna draw out the whole feature of the heart over here. And then we can talk a little bit more. There we go. Right, so this area of the heart, it corresponds to the right ventricle. Now, it would only correspond to the right ventricle if, and if at all, the person has inspired really well, if their heart is very, very vertical, or if at all they have a small heart and you're dealing with an X-ray of a, a small person in general, it would not correspond to that area if the person has not inspired that well. And if at all you're talking about, in some cases, if they are very obese as well. The reason why is because if the heart is not so vertical, this region, or this entire region would just be the um, right atrium. In this x-ray, however, this would be the right ventricle. This over here would be the right atrium. And we can see the aorta going up over here. So this whole section over here would be the ascending aorta. This region over here would be the aortic knuckle. And we can even trace that aorta back down and follow along this line over here, and that would be the descending aorta. 
Now, an interesting thing that I have to also mention is this area here. Does anyone know what area this is? And why is it so important? Can anyone tell from anatomy, why is that area so important? What do you think might be over there? <laughs> uh, yeah, the aorta is over there, but what area is it? And why is it so important? What do we know about, uh, let, me, let me kind of give you a hint over here. Um, it is to do with um, a structure that is very important for the left diaphragm. as well as a structure that is very important for the left side of the vocal cords. Yes, the phrenic nerve, exactly. The phrenic nerve, it, it comes over it like this. What's also important to know is because of embryology, the recurrent laryngeal nerve, although on the right, it actually makes a loop around the subclavian artery, on the left, it actually makes a loop around the aortic arch over here like this and goes up. So this area over here is known as something called the aortopulmonary area. And the reason why it's important is because the left phrenic nerve goes over it. So if there's any kind of pathology going on over here, and you've also noticed that the, 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 the left hemidiaphragm has dropped, it means that there might be a pathology that is interfering with the phrenic nerve, the left phrenic nerve, okay? So in this case, you can also see the left pulmonary air, uh, the left pulmonary artery also extending in like this over here. Now, the rest of the features are quite obvious to see. So this part over here would correspond to the left atrium. And finally, this whole region is all of it, all of it is all the left ventricle. Okay. So this is just a bit of a normal mediastinal anatomy and normal mediastinal contours of the heart. I mean, of the of the of the um, of, the, of, the, of the chest X-ray. What's next? So now we're up to D, and that's the diaphragm. Let me just undo the annotations. Hold on a second. There we go. Now the diaphragm is quite easy to spot. Um, the right hemidiaphragm is obviously going to be a little bit more raised than the left one. And the reason for that is the liver that actually protrudes out until here. And the left one has got the stomach. Um, one important thing that you have to know is that the diaphragm does not determine where the lungs end. And that is very, very well sort of seen in, 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 the, in the lateral view. Now, if we look at the anterior side, which is more on the right, um, you can see that although from, an, from a PA view, you would say the lungs would end over here. Although the lungs would end over here, you can see how much or how deep the, the lungs actually extend down to. Okay, so when we correspond this to a PA view, you can see that the lung feels, and this for this you need to, you know, have the have have a system that will sort of change the contrast as well. You can see the lungs actually extend all the way down till here, and the same goes over here. Now, a couple of features that you need to really spot in the when when you're looking at the diaphragm are the cardiophrenic angles over here and over here, as well as the costophrenic angles. You need to make sure that they're not blunt. What does blunting of the costophrenic angles mean? Does anyone know? And why is it important to spot that early? Yeah, fluid or thorax or most commonly just pleural effusions. Yeah, exactly. It's most commonly for pleural effusions. Now, another thing that I have to also point out because most of the time you would request a PA or just a standard chest X-ray and a lateral view is something that you can only request, well, per request. Um, if you notice that there's any costophrenic blunting over here, 
it's already far worse than you think it is. If you say that, oh no, there's only a little bit of cost of running blunting that you can spot over here or over here, you have to bear in mind that the fluid has already come all the way up to here. Okay, so you're talking about quite a lot of pleural effusion. And the reason for that is because you're not actually, you know, you're, not, you're not privileged to see the lateral view at that point. But you have to bear in mind, there's actually substantial amounts of fluid in the lungs already, in, in, in the pleural cavities already. So it is an emergency the moment you see cost of running blunting. You have to think about chest strain straight away at that point. Okay. And another feature that you can really appreciate here is a, is a, is a, is a, is a stomach bubble, is a gastric bubble over here. And that's just trapped air in the fundus. Nothing really anatomically or uh, pathologically significant about that. It's just trapped wind. That's it. Okay. Right. Next. Next, we'll just be talking about the pleura. Now, the pleura is nothing really too important, but it is important to know that um, the lung fields, before you even see them, you actually, you actually see if the pleura are present. And the reason why is because you need to know if at all there is any kind of thickening of the pleura, if there is any kind of pneumothorax. Now, in case there is a pneumothorax, you will know that the pleura will be completely squashed to one side where the lungs are and you want blackness. Um, and again, we'll, we'll highlight all of this when we're talking about the pathological um, um, aspects of, of chest x-rays. And finally, like we mentioned before, is to see if there's any kind of effusions. And by effusions, you also have to look at the costophrenic angle. So technically speaking, whenever you're looking at the diaphragm, you will have to go through the pleura as well at the same time. It's always wise to see both of these together. Right, I think we're nearly there. So after this, we, got, we have the lung fields or lung zones. Now, like I mentioned before, um, when it comes to a chest x-ray, you do not really divide them into their respective lobes. You, you, don't, you don't divide the lungs into respective lobes. You divide them into zones instead. And that is purely just because it's easier to, um, to locate a lesion that you're describing when you're reporting or when you're interpreting a chest x-ray particularly if you spotted one and you're trying to make a referral or an urgent referral to a respiratory consultant or a respiratory registrar on the phone, it's best to describe it as zones rather than lobes because you might not know where the lobe, you, you might not know what lobe is being affected. So this, just, this diagram just sort of captures what we or how we define the lobes or how we define the zones to be of the lungs. Okay, now the reason why this, this is important is because when you are trying to interpret, um, you always compare the zone, the zone. So you always compare the right upper to the left upper, the right middle to the left middle, and so on and so forth. Um, oftentimes, the, the more density that you see, um, the more abnormal it is. So usually when we're seeing a more denser part of the lung, we kind of attribute that towards either a consolidation. So in this case, a pneumonia or we kind of attribute this to a mass that you find. So therefore, uh, there might be some kind of a cancerous, pro uh, like, a, like a malignant process going on. But you also have to bear in mind, like we mentioned before, if there is a pneumothorax, that area will appear dark. So densities don't necessarily always correlate to pathology. Sometimes uh, darkness also correlates to pathology as well. Right. I think this is all for normal anatomy and normal or like a systematic approach. Um, thank you for listening to me this week. And in next week's lecture, we'll go through everything that is abnormal. So for now, you should have a basic understanding as to what would make an x-ray valid, what would, what would improve the quality of an x-ray and what to look out for before you even start interpreting an x-ray. And next we will go through the terminologies as to how you should describe an x-ray. And also we'll go through a lot of examples. There'll be a lot of slides on what to look out for and how things appear. So thank you for listening to me. And if you have any questions at all, shoot, shoot now. Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, it'll be um, one week from now. So it'll be on the 28th.
and that one will be a lot longer. So um, bring popcorn. Uh, I think Pritika can arrange for that. Um, I will I will send the slides off to Pritika, and you can have a look through it. Of course. Yeah, the recording will be uploaded on YouTube. It's okay. All right then, guys. Have a good evening. Yeah, it'll be it'll be on at six p.m. on the twenty eighth as well. That's right. Have a good evening, and I'll see you next week the same time. Oh, uh, could you guys please fill in the feedback form that's attached in the chat box? And I will share my screen now. <laughs>